No one ranks the most popular television programs on the planet, but if they did, one of them would have to be Top Gear. The British Automotive Show is seen by 350 million viewers in 170 countries every week, not including the clones it's inspired in Russia, Australia, and the United States. The original, which airs here on BBC America, is ostensibly about cars, but as we first reported last fall, it's really about the adventures of three clever middle-aged blokes who travel the world conducting all sorts of elaborate competitions, races, and challenges that push the boundaries of television and automotive acceptability. Part reality show, part buddy movie, part Monty Python. With spin-offs and merchandising, Top Gear is a billion-dollar global gold mine for the BBC, the same people who brought you I, Claudius, but you're not likely to confuse the two after you've seen this story. The story will continue in a moment. There's nothing on television quite like Top Gear. What began as a boring automotive program in the 1970s has morphed into this. That's the most amazing road I've ever seen. In this recent episode, the host took three of the world's highest performing cars on an expedition to find the best driving road in Europe, which they finally discovered in Romania. Viewers tune in to watch extravagantly filmed segments, usually involving some kind of motorized vehicle. It could be driving the smallest car ever made through the BBC's offices testing the toughness of long-haul trucks by smashing one through a brick wall. There's a news section, car reviews, and a talk show segment with international celebrities and Tom Cruise! who must agree to turn some laps in an underpowered Kia to demonstrate their driving prowess. Last summer, Tom Cruise nearly killed himself while clocking the season's fastest lap. We asked the executive producer, Andy Willman, to try and define the show's appeal. It's a journey into the male mind, which I believe is a really potentially very funny place, because, let's face it, nothing happens there. The show's popularity has turned a trio of aging automotive journalists with schoolboy senses of humor into worldwide television stars. No, I like the idea that us three are arbiters of taste. Yes, we are. <laughs> the first among equals is Jeremy Clarkson, a big, bombastic, chain-smoking newspaper columnist who is one of the best-known commentators in the UK. His subversive personality sets the tone and drives the action. I mean, you said some pretty outrageous things. All BMWs are driven by people who are psychologically unfit to drive anything more powerful than an electric razor. Yeah, that certainly was the case. I would change that to Audis now, but it was the case with BMW. You need to look at why did that person buy a BMW? There's something about the image of the car that appeals to them. They are what my son calls winners. They like to win. If I want to go to squash, I want to win. And there's no sense of, well, it was a good game. I want to win and I'm going to be cross if I lost. There's always that BMW thing. What makes a good car for you? Soul. Soul, definitely soul. Something that you just think, wow, there's something about this thing. It's talking to me. It's unbelievable. Clarkson's regular foil is James May, a connoisseur of cars and superior engineering. What's the fastest you've ever driven in a car? 259.2 uh, miles per hour. What kind of a car? Uh, Bugatti Veyron Super Sports. That was only last week. <laughs> Despite this achievement, his colleagues straight. call him Captain Slow for his pedantic, professorial bearing and absent-minded behavior. The running joke has them running into the back of whatever car he's driving. Sorry! Richard Hammond is the shortest and the youngest of the lot. He's called the hamster. He's the only one who bothers to whiten his teeth, dress stylishly, or feign sincerity when trying to explain the show. Effectively, it's three middle-aged-ish men exploring their passion for cars and how cars matter to other people. 
This all-male lineup strikes some as subliminally sexist, yet somehow Top Gear manages to attract a huge family audience that is 40% female. Women can look at us and go, and they can look at their partner who's got the fritos and the drinks and a massive stomach, and they can go, you're not so bad. Broadly speaking, the show uses cars and the people who drive them to comment on contemporary society. Take those slow-moving, road-hogging campers, which the British call caravans. Over the years, they've turned the destruction of them into an art form. I know in America it's a big deal, camping. But here, really, camping is just the end of the world, because it always rains, and I can't see why that's a holiday. Come on, everybody, we're going to go away and defecate in a bucket and live in a field in a small box and get in everybody's way on the way there. I mean, look at Many of their segments are vaguely disguised as pieces of consumer journalism. You put the news on, you always see news about third world wars, mm -hmm. and there's an army inside a Toyota pickup with, a, with Kalashnikovs. And it always, you just sort of watch it go, it's always a bloody Toyota pickup, isn't it, you know? And then you think, they must be like the cockroaches in a nuclear explosion. They cannot stop. So then you go, hang on, there's a film in that. Several films, actually, where they set out to destroy it, only to drive it away after minimal repairs. After the Toyota survived this building demolition, they retired it to a place of honor in the studio. God. They all agree that one secret to the show's success is their often toxic relationship. Sorry, I was, I was watching you about the this. You're now going to get macheted to death. Which yeah, was on I full display during a road trip in Bolivia. Walking. James is killing Jeremy. The, the chemistry that exists between uh, Richard, James and I has rather taken over. Now, you can't really engineer chemistry. That just happens. We really genuinely loathe each other. <laughs> Come on, Richard and James, everybody! Top Gear is taped inside a hangar at an old RAF airfield outside London. Their offices are a maze of dilapidated trailers that abut a specially built test track. This is the realm of the Stig, the show's fourth on-air personality, an anonymous professional race car driver who doesn't speak. The Stig was a happy accident. We, we couldn't find a racing driver capable of an intelligent comment. That's a problem that you find around the world. And then, I think Jeremy said, why does this driver need to talk at all? We tried to get him to utter a few syllables when he took us on a test drive in the new Camaro. It's a nice day for a drive. It didn't work. Driving 130 miles an hour and screeching around the hairpin turns, we didn't even hear a grunt. This is fun. What's his appeal? Well, kids like him because he's kind of. They, they love a helmeted thing, you know, and all that kind of superhero. He is also the perfect marketing tool, and his image helps sell the brand across the globe subsidizing one of the biggest budgets on the BBC. France! We can see France! Some of their elaborate stunts belong in the Guinness Book of World Records. They successfully crossed the English Channel in a Nissan pickup truck they converted into an amphibious car. They raced across the spine of Africa in junk heaps they bought on the local economy in Botswana. Yes! But one adventure stands above the rest. The absolute best thing we've done... Mm. Mm, North Pole, probably. No one else is going to do it, that's why. <laughs> Let's go to the pole! Go. Ow! Ow! In a race to the top of the world, Hammond ran alongside a dog sled, while Clarkson, May and the camera crew made the trip in a specially equipped two-ton truck. Oh, fuck We're just driving along and you start to hear that creak. As the ice started to creak, if the car had gone through, we would have been finished. It's minus 60 degrees, minus 70 degrees, we'd have been dead within two or three minutes. That was a time where you think, oh God, what am I doing here? They brought along gin and tonic to keep them warm. <laughs> You've got gin! It ended up taking a lot of heat for drinking while driving. Well, you see, that's the thing. You use the word driving, but technically it's actually a frozen ocean, so it's sailing. And you can sail if you've had a few drinks. 
This was our argument, and they, again, the BBC just went, yeah, great. The show manages to careen into controversy almost every week, usually for something Clarkson said. He's offended everyone from the prime minister to truck drivers who took offense at this characterization of their profession. It's a hard job. Change gear, change gear, change gear, check your mirrors, murder a prostitute, change gear, change gear, murder, check your mirrors. That's a lot of effort in a day. I mean, it's a weekly occurrence that somebody will complain. Top Gear was on last night, and it's just you sit back and wait for the complaints. But if you start to pay attention to everybody's concerns, you end up with something bland and boring. So you sort of have to ignore everybody in order to do the show how we want to do it. Speed is great. Speed works. Where would we be as a species without speed? You know, we'd still be eating mud. I am an alien! One of the most hair-raising adventures was in the U.S. They were each given $1,000 to buy a car in Miami and drive them to New Orleans. When they reached the Gulf Coast, the producers gave them a special challenge. Okay, it says here we must not be shot or arrested as we drive across the proud state of Alabama, but that we will get bonus points if we can get one of the others shot or arrested. Clarkson came up with the idea of painting slogans on each other's cars that were designed to test the limits of southern hospitality. So I was saying, well, what would really wind them up? I mean, I'm by and man love rules okay and country and western music is rubbish and all of the other things, Hillary for president that we wrote. Here we are, sweet home Alabama. We stopped at a gas station and a woman came out walking towards me and Jeremy. Now, are you all gay looking to see how long it takes to get beat up in a hick town? I'm not gay, I'm married. NASCAR sucks, country and western is rubbish. Guess what, you're in a hick town, man. We're going to die now. I recognised straight away, coming from quite a rough northern town here, um, that this it was ugly. It was going to become ugly. She said she was going to get the boys. <laughs> By then, pickup trucks full of people with guns were turning. And sort of milling around. And a man, a massive guy in the middle of the forecourt, had begun a countdown from 10, 10, 9. It, I'd got, I don't know what he was going to do when he got to 1. <laughs> He was operating at the very limit of his capacity, counting backwards from ten. But whatever was going to happen at one was going to be bad. So we ran. We just ran away. People really threw rocks at you. They really threw rocks at us. They pursued us in pickups. You didn't see all of it because the, the camera crew had to run away as well. And, uh, yeah. Actually, that's the most frightening and dangerous thing we've ever done. I did fear for my life slightly. But the episode that had the critics screaming for its cancellation put Richard Hammond behind the wheel of a vampire jet car going 300 miles an hour. Then a tire blew. It was touch and go. It was a bit touch and go. It was a, in a big coma. Uh, it was horrible for my wife and for my parents and my daughters. But there was briefly... A, you know, call for Top Gimmer's end. But that very quickly died away because I don't think there was the appetite for it from the public. Hammond eventually recovered and returned to the show four months later to talk about the accident. I think it was very important that we said to the world, if it can go that wrong, even in our silly, glossy television world, then it can go wrong in the real world. But despite the obvious risk to life and limb, they've all elected to carry on. We've had this arrangement so that what... You'd have to announce it on the following week, you know, this week, unfortunately, James May was killed making that item. And then you'd have to pause momentarily, but the next word, and we've all agreed on this, should be anyway. So you go, James May was killed there making that item. Anyway, the new Ford, which is, and just move it along. <laughs> so it's basically, he came, he made some noise, and now he's been killed, a bit like a housefly or a rock drummer. They, <laughs> they just come, they make noise, and they die. And we'll do the, do the same thing, and then we'll find somebody else who's either slow and pedantic, short and irritating or big and bombastic to come and fill our shoes.